There's a relatively obscure technique for woodwind instruments called multiphonics, playing multiple notes at the same time. As you can hear, it doesn't really replace multiple musicians playing in harmony. Most multiphonics, especially on the saxophone, sound more like a chainsaw than a musical chord, so the technique is mostly limited to contemporary classical music and improvised solos. Every once in a while, it'll show up as the central gimmick of a piece. Really, the main reason that people learn to play multiphonics is to say they can play multiphonics, because it's hard. And it is hard. It takes strong control of your breath and careful embouchure to be able to pull off. I think what makes it especially difficult to learn is even for people who can do it, it's not very clear what you're doing. You just kind of feel it. If I had to explain what it feels like to play multiphonics, I would say that it feels like unstable equilibrium. An equilibrium is a point where something will stay indefinitely. Mathematically, we say that it's a point where the derivative of potential energy is zero, so a flat spot. A stable equilibrium is one where even if you move slightly away, you'll still get pulled back to the same point. This happens when the second derivative is positive, so the potential is curved up. Think a pendulum hanging down, or a ball at the bottom of a valley. An unstable equilibrium is one where if you move even the slightest bit away, you'll keep moving and never return, like a ball on top of a hill, or a stick upside down in your hand. Generally speaking, to keep a system in a state of unstable equilibrium, you have to fight back against nature. To make a segue or a hoverboard stand up, you have to engineer an algorithm. To walk across a tightrope, you have to practice. My intuition, based on playing woodwind instruments, is that multiphonics is another case of this. Without even doing any physics yet, a normal note feels like a stable equilibrium, and multiphonics feels like you're always on the verge of being pulled one way or the other. It turns out that my intuition does have a bit of merit, and there is some fascinating physics behind this. So let's learn how it's possible to play multiple notes on an instrument that should only play one. Acoustic impedance is defined as pressure divided by flow. We use it to characterize what a system does to a sound wave traveling through it. It's the same idea as electrical impedance, or if you're not familiar with that, resistance. Maybe an even better analogy is index of refraction. Light travels differently through air and water, so when you look at a pond, the fish isn't exactly where you see it. But you don't just see the fish, you see your reflection, too. Where air and water meet, some of the light passes through and some gets reflected. This is because impedance mismatch causes reflections, whether our wave is light or radio or sound. A sound wave will travel differently through open air than in a tube, so there's an impedance mismatch at the opening. This means that when a pulse of air reaches the end of a tube, some of it will get reflected back. The western flute, and any flute relative, is basically a tube with both ends open. That means that excited pulses of air will bounce back and forth and form a standing wave. Since the pressure at either end of the tube has to be the same as the outside, so atmospheric pressure, this wave looks like half a sine wave. It needs to extend twice the length of the flute before it repeats, so the frequency will be the speed of sound divided by 2L. The lowest note on a shakuhachi, for example, is D4, which is 293.67 Hz. Plug that into our equation, and the instrument should be 58 centimeters long, or 1.9 shaku, Japanese feet. But the shakuhachi has its name because it's traditionally 1.8 shaku. It turns out that this equation overshoots the length because, in reality, the acoustic wave reflects just a little bit past the end of the tube. A clarinet, on the other hand, is a cylindrical tube with a reed and mouthpiece on one end, so basically that end is closed. At a closed end, the pressure does not have to be zero, it's whatever it was before the reflection, so our wave looks like this, and that has a frequency of 4L. <laughs> 
That means that a clarinet that is the same length as a flute will be twice as low, or an octave lower. Saxophones are also tubes with one closed end, but their conical bore changes the acoustics to make them behave more like flutes. So an alto sax, which is significantly longer than a B-flat clarinet, has roughly the same lowest note. Whether the instrument is open or closed, cylindrical or conical, we need to be able to play different notes, and the most common way of doing that is by changing the length of the tube. Not with a slide, but with holes. Drill a hole and measure the distance from the mouthpiece, and that's approximately the new length. It's not exact because hole size and other factors affect where exactly the reflection point is, but it's a good estimate. Going back to the shakuhachi, the instrument has five holes and plays a pentatonic scale. With all the holes open, the note is an octave higher than with all the holes closed. That means it should have twice the frequency or half the length, and sure enough, the thumb hole is just about halfway up the instrument. If I have my history right, these holes were traditionally placed with even spacing for aesthetic reasons. And when you apply our frequency equation for a flute, this lines up pretty closely with an equal temperament pentatonic scale. Changing the length of the instrument is not the only way of changing pitch, though. Let's go back to our diagram of standing waves in a tube. We know that a flute has to be this frequency because this is the sine wave that fits the boundary conditions. Both ends have to have an acoustic pressure of zero. However, this is not the only wave that fits. We could double the frequency, and that wave also fits. We could also triple the frequency, or quadruple it, or multiply it by any integer, and it still fits. These multiples of the fundamental frequency are called harmonics, and they are the primary way that woodwind instruments extend their range. By keeping all the lower holes closed and opening just a small hole halfway up the instrument, we force that spot to be at atmospheric pressure, so the note that plays is the second harmonic. Opening that hole isn't even really necessary. On most wind instruments, the musician can play different harmonics by changing their embouchure. It's interesting to note that for a clarinet or another cylindrical pipe with one closed end, the boundary conditions lead to only odd harmonics being possible. This is the main reason for the difference in tone between a saxophone and a clarinet, and it's also the reason that a clarinet doesn't overblow to an octave, but to an octave and a perfect fit. We now know that opening a hole can either change the effective length of the pipe or force a different harmonic. So what happens if I use one fingering and then I close not the next lowest note, but a hole below that. How will it affect the sound? Theoretically, the first open hole should become a reflection point, or a zero pressure node, and the first of the lower open holes should also become a reflection point. That would mean that two completely different pitches that are not harmonics of each other would be able to resonate in the pipes at the same time. That would give us multiphonics. So let's see what really happens. Oh, well, that was entirely normal. This is actually just the fingering for F sharp on a sax or a flute or a clarinet. Leaving a middle hole open like I described is called cross fingering, and it's a normal part of playing these instruments. All it does is make the effective length longer. Which makes sense, because there's always space between the holes, and that doesn't cause multiple reflection points unless the higher hole is close to the note of a harmonic. Then things get interesting. That's when we get multiphonics, like this. I hope I've done a good job of teaching you so far that the acoustics of wind instruments is highly dependent on geometry and other factors that make it difficult to predict. All of the nice math that I've shown you is only possible because I've made dramatic, but justified simplifications. In order to really get multiphonics, we're going to make further simplifications that are so dramatic they might just seem dumb, but I promise they're helpful. When you play, for example, a reed instrument, a pressure wave starts at the mouthpiece, gets reflected at the end, then when it makes it back to the mouthpiece, it's going to affect the reed, and therefore the next wave. It might change the amplitude, the period. The point is, a wind instrument is basically a feedback system, 
the output gets fed back to the input and changes the next output. So instead of looking at the complete continuous waveform of our instrument, let's treat each period of a wave as one discrete impulse. Before reaching the mouthpiece again, each impulse loses energy to things like the sound leaving the instrument, so we subtract a bit each time. This model is called impulse pattern formation, and even though it doesn't handle things like the shape of a wave or certain instrument's tone, it does handle the way a note evolves quite nicely. And that's what we're interested in for multiphonics. Like I showed you before, most multiphonics involve cross fingerings and multiple openings in the pipe. So we say that instead of one reflection point, there are two, and both of them cause feedback. This makes our equation a little bit more complicated, but not unmanageable. To see how this system evolves, we pick a value for g to start with, then pick our other parameters, alpha, beta 1, and beta 2. Alpha corresponds roughly with blowing pressure, and beta 1 and beta 2 represent the relative lengths between holes. Then we iteratively calculate this equation to get each new value of g. Here I've picked values for each of those, so let's see what happens over time. As you can see, we start with what looks like no discernible pattern, but eventually G settles on one constant value. This is quite a bit what it feels like to play a wind instrument sometimes. You don't notice it as much with higher instruments, but for Barry sax or contrabass clarinet or tuba, you can feel a bit of chaos before a note settles, and you have to practice to eliminate that. In math, we call this transient behavior. I said earlier that alpha represents blowing pressure, so what happens if we decrease it just a bit? Let's see. That's it! Just like before, we start with some transient randomness, but once it settles, it alternates between two different values. This is our multiphonics. We can even take this a step further. Let's do the same thing for a certain value of alpha, then run it until we pass all of the transient stuff. Then we'll record the value or values that it settles on and plot them on a graph. Let's do this for many values of alpha to see what happens as a musician gradually changes their blowing pressure while using a multiphonic fingering. At a certain pressure, the IPF abruptly splits into two notes. Let's lower the pressure even more. At a low enough pressure, we get chaos. What we've just created, by accident more or less, is called a bifurcation diagram, and it's very typical of a chaotic system. It's got quite a few visual similarities to the bifurcation diagram of the logistic map, for example. In my last video, I introduced chaos theory through the dyadic map, and although it's easy to prove certain properties about it, it does not have any parameters, so we can't make a cool diagram like this. I worry that an intro to chaos isn't complete without it, so if you've watched both videos, consider yourself introduced. Impulse pattern formation only considers discrete values, but if we take an existing waveform and scale each period to the ratio between the current and previous values of G, then we can neatly sonify the sequence that we generate. By gradually changing the value of alpha throughout a sample, you can even mimic the way that a musician starts a multiphonic, and hear the bifurcation happen. Here's an example that was made by the authors of this IPF paper. First a recording of an actual clarinet, then the sound that they synthesized. To end this video, I've used the IPF to mimic some of my own multiphonics. Thanks for watching.